Hello everyone and welcome to our 20th video. In the past two videos we have been talking about the main concepts of signalized intersections and how to determine a phase plan for them. In this video uh, we continue that phasing discussion and we also focus on how to find the cycle lengths and green time for each phase at a signalized intersection. On this slide, we are seeing a number of common phase plans that can be used to control the sequence of phases at the signalized intersections. You see two phases, three phases, four phases, and five phases. And there are a few things that I want to keep in mind. You see dashed line here. Those are permitted movements or the movements that need to yield to other cars or pedestrians to go through to, to continue their movement. For example, here you see this left turner, uh, left turning movement that is dashed. So that means that it needs to yield to the true traffic. And you see a lot of those dashed lines. The solid lines are those that that have the right of way. So they just go through, they don't need to yield to anyone and they can go through the intersection. One of the things that I want to show you is this part of this phase plan. You can see that the phase starts with left turners and then true and right turns follow. We call this phase plan a leading phase plan. It means that it starts with left turners and go through. We can also have a phase plan that is the opposite of this. It starts with true movement and then the left turns follow. That type of first phase plan is called a lagging phase plan. And you also can have something like this phase plan, this part of this phase plan that I'm showing you. So you start with left, then you go through true movement and then you finish with another left. So you start with the, this left, then we have true movement, and then we finish with this left. So this is a lead lag phase plan. So one of the things that I want you to keep in mind is that in this course, you are, we, we will not be asked to determine the best phase plan. The phase plan is going to be given to you based on which you're going to find the cycle lengths and green times. So what you see in this slide is pretty much covered in the previous slide. So I'm just going to keep forward, keep going forward. So if you remember, I talked about the number of phases that we are going to use. So usually each phase is associated with some lost time. So for that reason, we don't want to increase the number of phases because at some point adding new phases is not going to be helpful because you're going to introduce a lot of lost time. At the same time, for certain left turn movements or other movements, we need to have a protected phase to make sure that they can go through the intersection. So the objective of a traffic engineer is to use the minimum number of phases that provides enough opportunity for all movements to go through the intersection. So that's one thing that I want you all to keep in mind from all of our discussion about phases. So that brings us to this question. When do we use a protected left turn phase? So there are a number of factors that is going to influence that decision that should we use a protected left turn or not and i want you for for a few seconds to think about it you can pause the video think for a few seconds about when or under which condition it's gonna be either required or beneficial to use a left turn a protected left turn phase and one of the things that you need to keep in mind as always is safety So the factors that are going to influence the use of a protected left turn phase are volume, 
Do we have enough left turn and opposing volume so that it requires a protected left turn phase? The other factor is the delay. Do we have too much delay for left turn movements? If that's true, we need to probably add a protected left turn phase. Or if the queue is getting long and spillovers to the true movement and the pocket is gonna be the left turn pocket is gonna be filled with queuing with queued vehicles in that condition, you would need to provide a protected left turn phase. Sometimes coordination of traffic, of true traffic on an arterial requires you to postpone or delay the onset of true movement, the onset of green phase for true movement. So in that conditions, you may want to put a left hand phase so that you can postpone it. Opposing traffic speeds, if those are high and they would not provide enough opportunity for vehicles to identify uh, gaps that are long enough to make a left turn, then we need to have a protected left turn phase. Geometry, the number of left turn lanes, crossing distance, side distance, all of this are gonna play an important role in selecting a left turn phase. And most important than all, if you have any crash experience, that has to has something to do with left turners. In that case, you need to have a left turn phase. So you can see that there are a number of parameters that uh, and a number of factors that are gonna influence our decision on putting a left turn phase or not. So in this course, rather than considering all of those, we just consider the volume and we look into something that is called cross product of left turn volume and opposing true and right turn volumes and if that product of those volumes is more than a certain threshold uh, we will be using a left turn phase so here you see three numbers 50,000 90,000 and 110,000. And you can see that if the product is more than 50,000 and you have one opposing lane, you need to have a left turn phase. If that's more than 90,000 and you have two opposing lanes, you need to have a protected left turn phase. And for three opposing lanes, that is 110. So I'm going to show you an example here and Let's say my, I'm going to only focus on northbound left movement. And I want to see if for this movement, I need to protect the left, I need to provide a protected left hand phase or not. So let's say this movement has a volume of 100 vehicles per hour. And let's assume that the opposing volume in, on true movement is 500 and on left turn is uh, and on right turn is 50. So if you want to find the cross product, you need to know how many opposing lanes we have. So let's say these two movements just use one lane that is shared. Okay. In such a condition, the cross product is going to be the product of 100 into the summation of all opposing volumes. And that would be 100 into 550, which is equal to 55,000. So you see that that number is more than the threshold that is given here. As a result, we need to use a protected left turn phase. So the next concept that we will discuss on this slide is lane groups. 
everything that we have been talked about so far except for the cycle lengths is defined in a lane group and if you remember a lane group is either a single or a group of multiple lanes that they are grouped based on the allowed movement for example if they are making a left turn or a true move or a right turn or maybe a lane group that is used for a shared right and true movement So I'm giving you the I'm giving you different lane groups that we can have. Whenever you have an exclusive turn lane, that is gonna form a lane group. So if you have one exclusive left turn lane, that's a lane group. If you have two exclusive left turn lanes, those are grouped together and they form a lane group. If an approach includes an exclusive left turn or right turn lane, usually the remaining lanes form a single lane group. Those remaining la lanes usually are true lanes. Each shared lane on an approach forms a separate lane group. So let's take a look at this graph here. So if I have a shared lane that is used for left turn, true and right, that is one lane group. If I have an exclusive left turn lane, this is on uh, two, that, and I have a lane that is used for true and right, I have two lane groups. Let's uh, focus on this one here. Here I have an exclusive left turn lane, that's a lane group by itself. I have an exclusive true lane, that's a lane group for itself. And then I have a shared true and right. That's going to be a lane group for, it, for itself. Let me give you another example here. I'm going to draw um, eastbound of an intersection. And... Uh, let's go through this example and see how many lane groups we are going to have. So I'm having a um, exclusive left turn and I'm going to have another lane that is used for left and right. Then I have two lanes that are used for true. I'm going to have another lane that is used for shared right and true. And then I have an exclusive right turn. So if I have an intersection like that or an approach like that, how many lane groups do I have? So this exclusive lane by itself is one lane group. This shared lane is another lane group. These exclusive right true lanes are going to be grouped together. So these are the third lane group. Then my shared right and true is another lane group. And my exclusive right turn is my last lane group. So in this example, I had a total of five lane groups. What if I had another exclusive left turn here, left turn lane, then these two were forming one lane group. What if I had another lane here, then those three were forming the same lane group. I hope this example clarifies the, the concept of lane group for you all.
So the next concept that you want to talk about is the concept of critical lane group. So that's a lane group among the lane groups that are being served in one phase that has the highest analysis flow rate to saturation flow rate ratio. Okay, so that is the lane group, a critical lane group among all lane groups that are being served in one phase is the one that has the highest analysis flow rate to saturation flow rate ratio. So I'm going to go through an example and I hope that that example uh, is going to help you understand this concept a little bit better. So if I have an analysis flow rate of 100 vehicles here and 200 vehicles here. And I have a certain amount of green, green time, which which movement do you think should be used to determine the green time? If I provide enough green time for this movement that, that has 100 vehicles per hour, Am I going to have enough green time for the other movement? Or do I need to provide enough movement, enough green time for the movement that has 200 vehicles per hour? Well, the answer is clear. I need to provide enough green time for this movement, right? If I provide enough green time for this movement, because these two movements are going to be served at the same time, the other movement can, can go and it's going to have enough green time. Now, let's have the same example. And let's say that the saturation flow rate for the movement, for the westbound movement is 2,000 vehicles per hour per lane. And for the movement on eastbound, the sat flow is 500 vehicles per hour per lane. Now, which movement do you think is the critical one? One movement has twice the volume. But the other movement has a sat flow or in other words or in other words capacity to process vehicles that is one fourth of the other one. So that's why rather than looking into the volumes, we look into the ratio of volume to saturation flow rate. And the one that is giving us a higher ratio is the one that is the critical one. So this movement is giving me something in the order of 1.5, the other one 1.10. So all of a sudden now this movement is the critical one. And I need to be able to provide enough green time to process this movement rather than the other movement. So I'm just cleaning everything so that you can see what I have on this slide. So if enough green is provided to the critical movement, 
we know that the other movement can go through and you guys have already seen the example here we are getting ready to uh, start finding the optimal cycle lengths for an intersection but before that one last thing that we need to um, go through is the total intersection loss time and so here I'm just showing you the, the, the equation for that pretty much you need to know the loss time for each phase or critical length group and the summation of all those loss times is going to give you the intersection loss time so this is how you show it in the form of an equation so now we want to calculate the cycle lengths and throughout the next few slides i'm gonna go through different steps so that we can do that so we want to have two perspective here so one is flow rate the other one is the green and cycle length so the flow rate is gonna represent the demand that we have and green and cycle lengths are gonna represent the supply that we have so from the flow rate side uh, we want to have vi as the flow rate for critical length group i si is going to represent the saturation flow rate for critical length group i so what is the ratio of these two vi to s over i that's flow rate ratio for critical lane group i or percent hour that lane group i will require green if vi is the flow rate if si is the saturation flow rate the ratio of those is the percent hour critical lane group i will require green so that's the demand let's see what kind of supply we have gi is the green that we are providing c is the cycle length what is the ratio of gi over c that's percent hour critical length group i is served or is re or is receiving green so gi over c percent hour critical length group i is receiving green vi over si percent hour critical length group i requires green so if i write vi over si and gi over c what would you expect to see would you like vi over si to be greater than gi over c equal to that or less than that think about it do you want your demand to be more than your supply do you want your demand to be equal to that or you want your demand to be less than what you can accommodate So we would like GI over C, which is our supply, to be greater than or equal to VI over SI, which is the demand. What is going to happen if GI over C is identical to VI over SI? So it means that we are providing exactly enough time that can process the demand. What if the demand goes a little bit high or lower what if the stochasticity just changes it a little bit so for that reason we need to be able to have a little bit of safety net so the way that we do that is that we want gi over c not to be equal to vi over si but to be greater than that so one way to do that is to define a new variable that we call it x sub c here and say that x sub c is less than or equal to 1 and then 
we divide the demand side by this x sub c. So in a way, we are bumping up our demand. And we say that our supply should be equal to this bumped up demand. So in a way, our supply is greater than our original demand and it's equal to this bumped up demand. So X sub, uh, X sub C is something that we define for the entire intersection. So we don't have uh, one number for each lane group. This is one number across the intersection. So now what we are going to do is that we are going to sum the equation that we had in the previous slide over all critical lane groups. So what we had was that GI over C was equal to VI over XC into SI. And I'm summing that up over all critical movements. So what I what what, what am what am I gonna have for the left hand side of this equation or summation of GI over C over all critical movements? I'm gonna have G1 plus G2 plus Gn if I have n phases over C. And the summation of all effective greens is going to be equal to the cycle length minus the loss time. So I'm going to have C minus L divided by C or 1 minus L over C. So what am I going to have on the right hand side? We are going to see that in the next slide. So I'm going to have 1 minus LC equal to 1 over XC into summation of VI over SIs. And I'm going to multiply everything by C. So I'm going to have C minus L is equal to C over XC into summation of VI over SI. If you solve this equation for C, what you're going to get is going to be this equation. Your cycle length is equal to L into X sub C divided by X sub C minus the summation of VI over SI. So that equation is rewritten in this slide and that's the minimum cycle length that you should be using to accommodate all demand that you have at an intersection. L is total loss time, X sub C is the slack variable, V is the analysis flow rate, and S is the saturation flow rate. X sub C must be chosen for the desired degree of utilization. So if your X sub C is equal to one, we are finding a cycle length that yields operations at the capacity of the intersection. So if your volume goes up just a little bit, we're gonna have issues. What that equation gives us is the minimum cycle length for operations at a specific degree of capacity utilization. And what you need to keep in mind is that that cycle length does not necessarily minimize delay. It's not minimum delay cycle length. It's the shortest cycle length that is gonna lead to X sub C degree of capacity utilization. In addition to that equation, we also have a practical equation that was developed by Webster in 1958. If you look at it, it, it has some resemblance to the previous equation. 
but this is going to give you the optimal cycle lengths as a function of loss time and again analysis flow rate and saturation flow rates and n here is the number of crit critical length groups so the equation pretty much has the same concept as the previous equation now we have the cycle lengths we have found it and either we are using c min or c optimum and we know that that cycle length is equal to the summation of all effective greens and loss times so if we take out the total loss time from that cycle length we are going to have what we, what is going to remain is going to be all effective greens and what we want to do is that we want to distribute that among different lane groups so there are a number of ways to do that but one popular strategy is to distribute the green time so that v over c ratios are equalized for critical lane groups now c here is the capacity so that means that at each critical lane group the capacity or flow rate the ratio of flow rate to capacity is the same that's what we are going to do here so if you want to do that green time for lane group i is going to be equal to v over s for that lane group multiplied by cycle lengths divided by x sub c this equation is gonna distribute the cycle lengths among different lane groups critical lane groups so that your v over c ratio is balanced you can either use this equation or distribute the effective green time or c minus l based on different lane groups among different lane groups based on their v over s ratios let me give you a quick example so if i have An intersection like this and for this phase the critical V over S is V1 over S1 and for this phase it is V2 over S2 G1 is gonna be equal to V1 over s1 divided by v1 over s1 plus v2 over s2 into c minus l if you want to do that for g2 you just change this part to v2 over s2 and if you want to write that in a more general way what you're gonna have I'm gonna write it up here GI is gonna be equal to VI over SI into over summation of VJ over SJ on all J's multiplied by C minus L these two equations the one that I just wrote and the one that is on the slide are gonna give you the same exact green times all right I'm gonna stop here and in the next class we start with going through a few examples so that we can learn the concepts that we covered in the past three classes better have a good one